Um, well, the term arose um, from actually the right wing, which is why some some people on the left um, don't uh, pay it much much heed. It kind of arose from a, a group called the alt left, and uh, it was actually also used by Anders Bering Grevik in his uh, manifesto, the term cultural Marxism. So it has a few kind of uh, um, dubious um, associations uh, uh, as an actual uh, term for, say, critical theory. But I, I do think um, the term cultural Marxism does sum up an actual phenomena. You know what I mean? Like, um, I, I mean, growing up, um, in the 70s and 80s, uh, like I did, I mean, you know, you knew there was kind of like the left wing and the right wing, you know what I mean? And there was like the far left and the far right. I mean, the far left were represented by groups associated with communism, and obviously the far right were associated with groups who might have some kind of fascist uh, connection. In, in, say, the 80s, when people spoke about the left, people were always talking about, you know, traditional Marxist ideas uh, of, um, of the left, you know, I mean, class struggle, uh, material... Uh, you know, dialectical materialism, which is a critique of uh, political economy, um, you know, um, the dictatorship of the proletariat, um, you know, the proletariat rising up and, you know, uh, through unions and through other, through other forces and defeating the, um, the, the proletariat. But I think, obviously, in the, in, sorry, defeating the upper class bourgeoisie. But I think in, um, in recent years, uh, particularly since the fall of the Berlin Wall, there's been a kind of real mixing of, of, of I think both far left and far right ideas into, I guess, the mainstream of uh, capitalist discourse and culture, which is, I think, probably where um, this phenomenon of cultural Marxism was born. Um, and I think it comes about, and I noticed this trend in the late 80s, it comes about um, when to the traditional ideas of, of, um, of Marxism and left, of the left, um, become more associated with, um, I guess, politically correct ideas to do with, say, multicultural tolerance. And um, the term, um, it began to kind of like, to me, the left, as I said, it was to do with traditional ideas to do with Marxism. But then uh, in the 90s, in particular in the late 90s, it began to be more talk about multicultural tolerance and to do with uh, issues to do with, like, social justice or what become the social justice warrior movement, in a way you know, like gay rights, transgender rights, and these things, which weren't necessarily even connected to the left in the 80s, you know what I mean, um, mm -hmm. suddenly became almost to the fore, and you don't even hear the term class struggle or um, you know, dictatorship of the proletariat or even more traditional uh, far left and uh, even communist ideas often spoken about in universities or even, even publicly in left-wing conferences. And so I think, you know, I think the accusation of cultural Marxism is true to a certain extent, um, that there has been some kind of movement. And I think even left-wing people would surely have noticed this, uh, you know, this movement from traditional Marxism towards this more, um, you know, multicultural discourse and also gay and lesbian rights, transgender rights, and, I mean, you know, and, and this kind of thing. Now, exactly where did cultural Marxism come from? I think it dates back to um, Herbert Marcuse, uh, uh, and also the the Frankfurt School, people like Adorno uh, and, and people like this, who, you know, began to discuss, you know, um, you know, that all, you know, everything is kind of like a, a, um, a kind of product of like, uh, everything is kind of like a product of like oppression, you know, or like capitalist oppression or like um, patriarchal or imperial oppression, you know what I mean? Everything is a symptom of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and it began, and I guess, the accusation with cultural Marxism is there's been a great kind of, um, you know, march into the universities where this kind of viewpoint has, since the Frankfurt School and since uh, Herbert Marcuse's day in the 50s, um, you know, it seems like everyone how holds a general cultural Marxist viewpoint. For example, I mean, you know, you go to any university to question, for example, uh, cultural diversity, you know, as a, as, a, as a plus. Look at Japan, for example. I mean, this is a very successful society that is not. Um, you know, cultural, culturally diverse. It's extremely Japanese. Of course, there are some expats there, but it's basically 99% Japanese. And this is a very successful um, country, a very successful, unified and strong country. So um, this is basically a monoculture. And it's not, they're not interested in diversity at all. And there are also many other countries. China is another example. There are many Asian countries that are not interested in diversity. There are many Arab countries, like Saudi Arabia. They're not the least bit interested in diversity. Yeah. You know, they've taken in no refugees from the recent Syrian crisis, none. I mean, millions have poured into Europe. You know, I mean, they've got, they've got enough facilities in Saudi Arabia to put up literally millions of people. They do every year with, 
with yeah. Mecca, they let in nobody. Yeah. Israel, of course, you know, I mean, all the Jewish intellectuals, they love to recommend multiculturalism for Europe, but for Israel, surprisingly enough, they have a different opinion. <laughs> the different opinion is, is that no, 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 it's open borders for Europe, you know, all, everyone can go there, but for Israel, closed borders, and not only that, we're going to put up giant walls mm -hmm. um, between us and the Palestinians, and not only that, when, we, when you're not looking, we're going to sneak in and we're going to steal some more Palestinian land, suddenly it's Israeli land, so that's how that works. So, you know, this is a lighter bullshit. Um, this is all part, I think, of the cultural Marxist phenomenon. Well, I think, you know, it is an accusation of bad conscious, um, and I think that the left in a lot of ways, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always somebody, and I, I studied university, um, I've always had a, you know, obviously, right, right behind me here, and I, I decided to shoot, we have, of course, Ho Chi Minh and uh, Chairman Mao, uh, busts, which I, which I got in Hong Kong, and... Um, and Vietnam, respectively. I, I mean, I've always been fascinated by both the left and the right. So, I mean, I'll lay my cards on the table. I'm fascinated by dictators of the left and the right, and by extreme politics on the far left and the far right. I, it's always interested in me, and I've never seen it even being that, you know, controversial that you're interested in both. To me, it's like yin and yang, or mm. and it even meets up, and, you know, there are quite some similarities. And obviously, there are good things about the far left, and there are some bad things. Obviously, a lot of the history of oppression of the of, of like communism uh, and like Russia is it you know Stalin's atrocities and Mao's atrocities. These are things I don't think anyone should celebrate. And Hitler's atrocities or, or, or Mussolini's atrocities in North Africa. So you know I'm interested in both of these things, but I'm not interested in promoting the, the negative side of it, so to speak. So that's that's kind of my my personal interest in it. But like I think it's it's interesting the way that this phenomena, which began with people like Adorno and Marcuse, has become. A kind of, um, and I'll call on another another philosopher who's actually here behind me, Gramsci. Um, he he says, and I think it's very true, um, that to hold power within within a society, you have to be able to um, hold the um, discursive space. That means the kind of space, for example, on Facebook or on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That what is what are you allowed to discuss? Now, basically, now all ideas associated with cultural Marxism. Uh, which is multicultural tolerance, lesbian and gay rights, advocating all these things is completely the right thing to do. Anyone can get on Facebook and, you know, and promote transgender rights and you'll be applauded. You'll get 100 likes, you'll get 1,000 likes. Go. Now, if you run counter to that and say, look, I'm not too sure about this or, you know, I'm not too sure about... Is multiculturalism, for example, which is the big uh, elephant in the living room. I mean, mm -hmm. I think a limited multiculturalism is fine, but I think when a society becomes so multicultural that... It, it loses its actual identity. So that, you know, you might go to parts of London and it's just full of Muslim people, for example, and, you know, you wonder, am I in Muslim or am I, sorry, am I in London or am I in, um, I don't know, Saudi Arabia or, or am I in Lebanon or somewhere like that? And I think that, you know, is when it can become problematic. And obviously with the war on terror, with the fact that the West, you know, and the capitalist West, which is you know, up to no good, and both the left and the right have kind of been good critics of what the uh, capitalists have been doing. I mean, they've been involved in a period war with um, Arab peoples um, mm. since September 11, which we now see as a very dubious event. Um, it now seems like the Saudis were involved, as, as Obama recently, which used to be a conspiracy theory to say this, but now uh, Obama has admitted, yeah, there's this document and you can't really, I can't really discuss it because it implicates our dear friends the Saudis. And we all know the Saudis are uh, like a very strong ally of the US. So, I mean, if the, do you think the Saudis are going to attack America without, you know, without like American permission? So, I mean, this whole September 11 event is very dubious. And it's created the whole, it's created the war on terror, which, you know, I mean, I saw an Australian general here discussing it. He said this could be a hundred year war. So these are the kind of stakes. And, and to me, this is what's interesting about cultural Marxism, because I think, and I think why real leftists should reject it, is because um, it, it, it dilutes real left wing, you know, real Marxism or real, you know, like, for example, Bernie Sanders, I think, is, is great. You know, he's been, he's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed his campaign, because basically he's banged on, like, you know, banged on his drum over and over again about one of you know, two, the major two or three um, Marxist points, which is economic inequity. You know what I mean? We are living in a time, you know, it, it, the level of criminality at the, at the upper limits of, of capitalism is, is extraordinary. And then, and then the average person is having to work harder. Not only that, men and women, like, for example, in the old days when it was just 
a men, you know, like my father he used to work and my mother didn't used to work. Now, both sexes have to work and probably to earn less than one man yeah. used to make in, say, the 50s and 60s. So this is a scam, you know, and this is, this is I think, the capitalists and, you know, Stalin. I'll bring up Stalin here. He, 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 he said that uh, when, uh, Stalin said, when, when, I, when I leave, the capitalists will drown you like a bunch of blind kittens. And I don't think he was far wrong. You know what I mean? Old Uncle Stalin. I mean, he may have been wrong about a few things, but he was right. You need a strong man. To, to really fight these bastards because they are super cunning these these capitalists mm. and um, mm. and they have uh, attacked um, the working class you know for example even though feminism which is again it, it's I would say that's a it's, that's a belief connected to cultural Marxism in a way feminism in a way has been monetized obviously people who are original feminists getting women the vote uh, uh, and even second wave feminism. But in a way, it's been monetized. You can see capitalism has agreed to it because it could see the angle, how it could benefit. It's like, okay, well, half the people in, in the Western world didn't used to work. You know what I mean? Now we can work. Now they're going to pay taxes. Hang on a minute. We're going to make a whole stack of money about, out of this. You know what I mean? This is great. You know? So you can see how capitalism, you know, uh, has turned feminism into a profit. And now women slave away their whole lives. I mean, not only that, they're supposed to have children as well. Along, along mm. the way. Mm. So they've doubled the whole pressure on themselves. So it's, it's uh, and the same with men. And, you know, and I think this is why the main uh, message of economic inequity, which has never been more unequal than it is right now, I think. Maybe at a time around the French Revolution is another time where there's been such vast inequity. And that led to a very bloody revolution, if your history books uh, uh, remind you. So I think we're at that kind of time. You know, we have a mega elite. We have 100 people who have, you know, more wealth than the bottom 3 billion on the planet. This can't last. I mean, no wonder every. I mean, all these people who are like the mega elite, they all preach often cultural Marxist philosophy. That should make you very suspicious. Someone like Mark Zuckerberg is always talking about, oh, we, we, like, we love, you know, multicultural tolerance, gay and lesbian rights. He says, we've got, to build, we've got to build bridges, he says, you know, not walls. He says from behind a personal wall of security, mm. and he lives inside this massive apartment with these giant walls. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this is a bullshit artist, basically. Yeah. This is someone who lives inside a fortified citadel with people with machine guns, you know what I mean, mm. aimed at the outside, advocating you know, brotherly love. When he's not interested in brotherly love, he is interested in greed. He's interested in using everyone's uh, information on Facebook and making a tri you know, fucking billions of dollars. Oh, God. Excelling it and exploiting it and fuck your privacy and God knows what. So, you know what I mean? Like, this is a classic example. So, to me, um, I think it is valid um, to have this fight going on at the moment between cultural Marxists and the traditional left. I think the traditional left has great ideas to do with, like, you know, um, financial inequity and, and there's the unions and uh, the proletariat standing up for itself. Mm. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, this is what it's about. Those old values are great values and they're some of the values that Bernie Sanders was going on about. But many of these things in relation to multicultural tolerance, lesbian, I mean, transgender toilets. I mean, we're on the brink of mm. World War Three. you know, as James Woods said recently. We're on the brink of World War Three, and what are we arguing about? Transgender toilets? I mean, billions of people, millions of people are going to die. And we're, a, I mean, transgender people are a very small minority of the gay community. Not even 1% of the gay community is. So we're talking about a tiny fraction of the whole world's population. This is a major issue. This is complete bullshit. What this is is a distraction. They're distracting you with this. They're making you believe some kind of social justice is going on some kind of left-wing agenda, but it isn't. This is why the, the globalists and their media are constantly promoting the issue of transgender rights. Because it's actually meaningless mm. in the essential... In, in a the, deterrent. In the, in the, yeah, it's meaningless in the kind of uh, mm. grand scheme yeah. of things. You know, what about all these horrible people, you know, all these people who are dying every single day in Syria? Why don't we stop this war in Syria? Why don't we ask who the hell is behind this war in Syria? We know who it is. It's America, it's Israel, it's the Saudis, and it's Turkey. And the Saudis and Turkey are like our puppets. So at the top of the leadership thing, you've got Israel and you've got um, the US. And they're the only countries that have anything to gain from destroying Syria and attacking Assad. And the, the human rights uh, atrocity that's gone on there. And you see Russia has been standing up for Assad and trying to bring peace. And every time he has a success and it looks like, you know, Assad's made a comeback and restored stability. I mean, and, and, and any of these countries that America has invaded, Afghanistan, Iraq, these are now wrecked countries. It's not democracy now. They're not some flourishing democracy. But see, that's the point. People say America says they want democracy when they... But that's a lie. They don't. They want to destroy a country. They want to, like, hobble it for 20 or 30 years so that it will be no threat to anybody, particularly 
their favourite little country, Israel, you know, which is like, you know, at the centre of all this, like the giant spider in the middle of the web. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, ha I have a friend of mine, um, Jack Sargent, who says that cultural Marxism is, is not real. It's basically, it's, it's a kind of thing that right-wingers, the term right-wingers have invented to describe basically, uh, you know, like something that they consider fictional, but um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I mean, I've had this discussion with many left-wingers, and I think they, I think, you know, I mean, for example, let's go back to this, I mean, I don't want to harp on the transgender issue, but what the hell would have Karl Marx thought of transgenderism? I'm not entirely sure. First of all, he never wrote on it. So it obviously wasn't too important an issue that he was like, you know, he didn't dedicate a chapter of Capital, which is just up there, by the way, in its three-volume version. Um, he didn't dedicate a chapter to transgender toilets. I would even suspect that he would consider um, the whole issue of transgender, even maybe even the, the issue of gay and lesbian rights, to be bourgeoisie decadence. You know what I mean? He often speaks of bourgeoisie decadence, which is basically uh, the upper elite's kind of... Um, Decadence, you know what I mean? And he says that the bourgeoisie, one of the things about the bourgeoisie is it's very decadent and it celebrates perverse sexuality. It celebrates, you know, sexual, you know, getting up to whatever the hell you want to get up to. So I'm not entirely sure that Marx and the traditional left and many of the other Marxist thinkers would, to would support the gay and lesbian issues and, uh, and this whole transgender thing. So I think the accusation of bad faith is something that, I mean, should be considered. Now, I have absolutely no problem myself with gay rights. I don't even, even care if transgenders have their own buddy tall. I couldn't give a shit. But I find the, the, the topic to be a distraction. I think there are much more important issues of social justice we need to be talking about based around traditional um, left-wing ideas of financial inequity, you know, the vast um, difference between rich and poor, which, it, which has grown larger since the Berlin Wall came down, when it should have, you know, um, being made more equitable. And I think this is a, a great tragedy. And not only this is something that, that's, that's, you know, what's it called, relevant to Western civilization. Think about all the people in the third world, you know what I mean, and the vast financial inequity there. I mean, why don't we try bringing, you know, like actual like economic equity to these countries? Mm -hmm. You know, we could be going and we could offer them debt relief. You know, we have these organizations like the World Bank that are all globalist, you know, connected to this idea of the new world order. Um, you know, it, it's all very nefarious. This, this, it, seems, it seems to me like there's a small group of plutocrats trying to enslave humanity and that basically all our media are somehow involved in this. And I think this is something that both the far left and the traditional left and the far right and the right can to stand together and fight against because it's all a load of bullshit in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Nietzsche. cultural Nietzscheanism, I, I was having a discussion on Facebook, which is where I, I expound a lot of these ideas. Cultural Nietzscheanism, uh, obviously, is based around the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think there is a cultural Nietzscheanism, you know what I mean? Um, I think whenever, whenever somebody says, you know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps or oh. get over it, mate, or, right. you know, yeah. I mean, um, some libertarian um, right-wing philosophies are kind of Nietzschean. Ayn Rand has a kind of Nietzschean flavour. So I think there is a cultural Nietzscheanism. Um, I don't think it's, 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 it's certainly not as um, predominant in our culture as, as maybe cultural Marxism is. And, and I mean, you know, I'm not entirely uh, opposed to all aspects of cultural Marxism. As I said, I, I think, you know, a limited tolerance to, a, to, you know, a limited multiculturalism is fine. I think a support of the gay community is fine and making sure that they're not bullied and they're making sure that they have basic human rights you know, like any other citizen in Western civilization, is fine. I think these are these are fine things to to support, and I think they're fine things to um, to advocate. But I think that they should not be advocated at the uh, at the loss of you know the what I consider the main two points of both the left and the right. The left being economic inequity, and the right being um, you know basically maintaining cultural hegemony and a kind of uh, more movement towards a kind of nationalist kind of um, unified um, body, which I think is, which I think both are noble goals, but you should not pursue them in, a, in an extreme way. Obviously, history has taught us that pursuing both in an extreme way can lead to disaster. So that's my opinion on that. Okay. Well, I think it's, it's, it's quite simple, really. I mean, I think the left needs to, you know, basically go back and, and reread its canon, you know what I mean? Which, some of which is behind me. And, yeah. um, and to rediscover the true power. I mean, I think 
Bernie Sanders has been doing it. You know, I mean, the way he, he bangs on about, you know, every American should have a right to free health care. Every, uh, you know, American uh, should have a right to, uh, you know, go to university for free. Mm. I mean, these are, these are great left-wing ideas. And these should not only be ideas that should be something that Americans fight about. This is something that should go on in, you know, Southeast Asia or any developed nation. Countries like Thailand, countries like Vietnam. I mean, some countries like Vietnam might have some of this because they have a communist background, for example. But these, you know, basic access to health care, um, you know, education, these are things that should be worldwide rights. And this is what the left should be involved in. And I think the right wing should totally support these things. You know, I mean, I think if, if I, uh, to fault the right, and I'm someone, I'm considered the person of the right by some people, to fault the right, um, I would absolutely, and I, and I detest the way that, the, the, the far right and the right, to some extent, worships the rich. You know what I mean? Mm. It worships mm. rampant success, rampant entrepreneurship. You know, people like the Koch brothers, for example, are right wing. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and like, mm. even, it's a name here, Palmer or whatever. What's his name? Uh, Clive Palmer. Mm. You know, he's obviously been involved in a bit of a shoddy deal recently with some nickel mine or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, you know, this is not right. You know, I mean, I don't have a problem with someone being wealthy. You know what I mean? But I... I my personal opinion is there shouldn't be billionaires. When you when you get up to nine hundred ninety nine million dollars, yeah, you know anything over that should go back, or, or most of it should be then taxed and given back to the the government, the country of your birth. So you know whatever you, whatever country you were born, whether it be Australia or so we get all Rupert Murdoch's money basically. That'd be nice, you know, <laughs> all those billions. Think of all the churches and not churches, all the hospitals and you know universities we could build with all that Rupert Murdoch money. So Rupert, we're coming for you, mate. Look out. Well, look, you know, I think there are a lot of issues um, that have often kept the far left and the far right from each other. You know what I mean? I, and I, as I said, I mentioned it before, I think there are two basic truths um, that, that both the left and the right play on. Um, the left, to me, has always been correct in relation when, it's, when it talks about economic inequity, when it talks about financial inequality, and it tries to ameliorate that, when it tries to make it more even. And, uh, you know, even through unions and recommends unions and recommends... Um, you know, free education and, and, and the, you know, free health and, and you know, paid maternity leave and, and uh, you know, like decent meals for children at schools. I mean, I absolutely support all this, you know. But I would say that the left wing are particularly intolerant of, of even listening to far right people who say basically that, you know, I mean, that all this stuff is great, but we need a, we need a strong society. We need a strong nationalist kind of society. Um, that, uh, you know, has a, has a strong united community and that there are limits to multicultural uh, tolerance, for example. You know, for example, uh, if there are Muslim people who come to this country and who embrace Australian values and want to, uh, you know, make a successful life, I think we should welcome them, you know what I mean? But if there are people who come here and they want to bring, say, their, their radical ideas about Islam that are un-Australian, mm -hmm. you know, and I think these people should essentially be asked to leave. And, for example, there's a gang uh, from Sudan recently called the Apex Gang. Mm -hmm. from, they've come recently and they've formed an ethnic gang and there's been a lot of controversy. People have spoken about deporting this gang and even Sudanese elders have said, listen, if these, you know, we're from Sudan, we come here, we want to live here and be successful. And they've said themselves, if these youngsters won't think, deport them, you know? Because, you know, I've been to Africa and they're very strict. You know, someone steals in Africa... I've seen them. They, they bloody beat the shit out that's of them right that's, there that's on the street. Yep. They catch someone shoplifting. They'll bloody take a stick and whip the hell out of them. You know what I mean? Because they don't fuck around. So it's one you bad know? bunch. Exactly. Yeah. So they know how to deal. You know, and the problem, I think, is this kind of weakness. And back, I guess, dates back to cultural Marxism or whatever. There's a kind of weakness that comes with it that, that makes Western people seem weak. You know what I mean? And I think we need to be tough. We're living in a tough world and we're basically up against the, the meanest, nastiest bastards on the planet. Basically the plutocrats, the world's wealth, the world's wealthiest people. No, not, not everybody who's wealthy is, is, a, is a nasty person. There seem to be some nice ones out there who have given money back. I mean, some people like Richard Branson seem like a nice guy and, you know, have earned their success to some extent and, and some give back and there are many other examples of these. So I think there are, there are good rich people and they're welcome to, you know, get on board this new revolution. But I think they can unite both sides, you know, and they both need to acknowledge the two things that they value. They need to work out a kind of, uh, you know, way... You know, a balance between the two. And then let's just, you know, go after the world's richest. I mean, you know, like, there's that new Michael Mann, sorry, Michael Moore film. Oh, yeah, Where yeah. to invade next? Yeah. I've got the yeah, answer yeah. to that. that I mean, was that was a kind of, that film, it's not bad. It was a kind of tribute to kind of European socialism. Mm -hmm. But basically, these are all white countries who have incredibly successful systems 
of socialism that are European. And that's because these European people have built these systems of socialism over, say, 70 years since World War II. This model can be exported to the world. It can be exported to America. It can be exported to uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, even the Middle East, eventually, yeah. once they learn to calm down and stop murdering each other like mad buggers. And maybe if we stop bombing the living hell out of them, that might help too. Yeah. So um, I think this is, this is it, you know, and this is where the future lies. And I think there's a great, a great opportunity we have to, uh, you know, like open our minds and, you know, look at our own rhetoric, both on the left and right, and try and, uh, you know, move forward with positive uh, ideas. I mean, for example, someone like Zizek, Slazo Zizek, I mean, he's someone who is, is a, he calls himself a communist, but he, you know, he's spoken out against multiculturalism, he's spoken out against many things that traditionally the left has supported. So, I mean, he's someone who's clearly contravening the, uh, the political correct paradigm. And, you know, that's another thing. Political correctness, I mean, left-wing people are mainly associated with political correctness. Now, that's complete bullshit, mate. On, on, on campus, you should be able to discuss anything. If people want to talk about any kind of ideas, they don't need a fucking safe space and they don't need students <laughs> running off to some corner saying, oh, my God, you said something I don't like. Or someone painted Donald Trump on chalk and they all scream and yell. It's like, that is absolutely bullshit. And if left-wingers support that, they're complete idiots. You know, I mean, Marx wouldn't have supported that. Freedom of speech, ladies and gentlemen, and that includes for your enemies. Because as Chomsky has said, freedom of speech is not real unless you include. That means neo-Nazis. That means people who want to scream and yell and run around and shout anti-Semitic phrases. You have to support their freedom of speech as well. So that's it. You know, that's basically ways we can fight. And I want to thank Nathan Hill for interviewing me today. And thank you, Richard. I want to thank uh, Ian uh, Michael Griggs Ball and the uh, lawyers uh, in the United Kingdom for inviting me to speak on cultural Marxism and the uh, pseudo left. Let's get out there and fight the power, gang. Like our friends did before us. Ha, ha, ha.